simple life in light I want to live a simple life in love I want to live all my love I want to Good morning, everyone. Did you sleep well after that movie and spontaneous dance party? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, just have such deep gratitude for all of you coming together and joining in this with us. I have very deep gratitude for Jesus being a way shower for us. As it says in A Course in Miracles, Jesus was the first to complete his part perfectly. And therefore he is in charge of the plan of atonement. So that's why Jesus and Holy Spirit are really synonymous to me. It's the same presence. It's guiding the awakening. That's why Jesus gets the title, The Way, The Truth, and The Life, because he's gone through the portal of atonement or complete forgiveness and correction. And therefore, he has transcended time and space, so he's, I'd say he's even a little more than an elder brother now. He's, he's in charge of the plan. He's... He's in charge of it. He works directly with you when you open your heart to Jesus and you say, guide me and lead me, and he knows the way. He is the symbol for God because the Christ and the Creator are one in spirit, so it's a, it's a direct connection, a direct link to God. And so, of course, in my life, in the parable of David, 33 years ago when the Course came into my life, and shortly after that when I just said, okay, Jesus, you're in charge. I, I'm just going to follow whatever you tell me. I just give it all to you. I give every skills, abilities, ambitions, future goals, take the whole package, and you have your way. That was, of course, the most important decision that I would ever make and Jesus would remind me, well, there's still the atonement. We've got work to do <laughs> in your mind. We've got to clear away a lot of ego, a lot of unconscious ego. So even though I was euphoric when I came across the Course and even though I had mystical experiences and was ready to be pointed to the nearest mountain to ascend Jesus and the angels had a good laugh with that one. Like, no, no, you're at the beginning. It's A. You're talking about Z. <laughs> We're talking A. <laughs> We've got a lot of work to do, so pay close attention. We have many instructions to deliver. You have many missions to be on. And uh, you're just beginning. You're at the beginning. You're not at the end. And so... And then with that movie yesterday, wow, that movie yesterday, hmm. <laughs> I'm not trying to do double meanings, but Jesus is playing with the words. Uh, wow, it's so, so touched, I think all of us, that's why the, uh, actually Francis and I both, all through the day yesterday, had uh, John Lennon and George Harrison in mind. We just discovered it when we were talking right before starting today, but we both had them in mind. It was almost like they wanted to participate and uh, 
in our, <laughs> into the kingdom retreat. And it was like, so I kept hearing, yeah, uh, give peace a chance, I told Kirsten, cue that one up, and then give me love, give me peace on earth. And then they brought in my sweet Lord, but uh, their presence was so felt. And that movie came out this year, and when the movie came out and premiered and started making its way around the world, John Lennon would have been 78. Uh, but you can imagine my happy surprise when I woke up this morning and I was scrolling on Twitter and they said, Today, October 9th, is John's 79th birthday. And I was like, oh, I had a bit of tears. <laughs> Like, oh, your presence is very felt, very strong with us here. Because I remember listening to all of those songs. Oh, yes, all the Beatles songs with Lennon and McCartney, but all the John Lennon songs of Watching the Wheels. I was playing them this morning, Instant Karma, uh, Number Nine Dream. I woke up this morning, that was what was playing in my song, Number Nine Dream from John Lennon. I just felt all this swirl of energy, and then I discovered it's his birthday, and so John is definitely with us here. The bodies may pass away, but uh, John is right with us. And then it got me thinking about, on the timeline, how uh, in 1965, the Beatles were just getting really revved up, you know, in 1965. And in 1965 was when Jesus was speaking to this small little woman in New York City in her mind saying, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. So actually Jesus was unleashing the Beatles on the world at the same time <laughs> as beginning to unleash his course. And I can only imagine that the ego was going, uh-oh. <laughs> he means business now. Sending those four young guys from Liverpool out already. They're stirring up a lot of love all over the planet with their songs. And the ego wasn't even aware that Jesus was beginning to dictate a course in miracles into the realm. The same year the Beatles were really revving up. So we're here now. What seems to be, we'll say, 2019, heading into 2020, and we've had, we've had decades now to experience the Course, and even more, the Beatles. And we've got a lot of love in our hearts. You could feel it just springing forth last night, the spontaneous dances and grabbing hands and swirling around. This usually happens at the end of the retreat. We are ready <laughs> to go much deeper on our first full day. We are, we have George Harrison and John leading us in a swirl dance here in, in Southern Holland in a castle. So we are ready to go. Uh, and in the early days too, they received a lot of special messages from Jesus that or not in the course, but Judy Scutch gave me one of those um, several years ago when I was having lunch with her. A group of us were having lunch with her, and um, and it said because they were very curious. Uh, Helen and and Bill and Ken and Judy, the original four, which were kind of given the mission to bring the course to the world, they were very curious about. What is this plan? Tell us more about this plan of awakening. We, we're very curious because, you know, Bill and Helen were research psychologists, so this is kind of exciting stuff for them. You know, Bill's getting into Edgar Cayce and astrology, and their minds are expanding Christian science and all kinds of things. They're very curious about this plan, and basically, the special message Jesus said, well, the plan involves people who have not even met yet, and actually many people who aren't even born yet. You can only imagine <laughs> these four curious human beings. And, and then there's this plan, seemingly, it's actually all happening simultaneously, and it's actually already complete. Because the instant the separation seemed to happen, simultaneously the atonement principle 
came into being, which was the correction for the seeming separation. And it took the Holy Spirit all of less than one second to handle this tiny mad idea. Of course, you know, doesn't give us an Adam and Eve story, and we don't have any apples and tempting snakes and everything like that, but we do have into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Well, the Holy Spirit didn't uh, hesitate. The Holy Spirit had a good laugh <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Because the Holy Spirit is an eternal creation, but it, the Holy Spirit sprang forth immediately as the atonement principle, like a correction for an absurd, impossible idea. And that principle was there, and then Jesus was the first to fully accept that principle, and that's why he's the way, the truth, the life. That's why he's the way shower. He was the first one to accept in time. Now, that still is from a linear perspective, but I would say that um, all of you, the ones who have worked with the Course, you know, are very honored to be a part of the first phase with the Course, the first generation. And the first generation, you know, receives it as a book and begins reading it, studying it, and practicing it, and practicing what it says, and using the workbook lessons and so forth. But because it was given, as Helen said, now at last a, a pathway to God for intellectuals, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of crude, this first phase, because this is almost like just landing, almost like when the Apollo mission went to the moon. The eagle has landed. <laughs> you know, those little pods went down in the moon dust, and that was the first trip to the moon. Well, the course coming into this realm, it, it landed in New York City, and now it's proliferated over the decades. But actually, the course, just studying the course, and practicing the course are absolutely essential and cannot be skipped over. But as you study it and as you practice it, just like a, a violinist practices or a pianist practices or an athlete practices, but for that athlete, it's not all about practice and it's not all about game day and it's not all about performance, but athletes will tell you they have these extraordinary moments when they're in the zone and they lose awareness of everything. It seems like everything slows down. And they're just these ah moments of, oh my God, it's spectacularly beautiful. And it has nothing to do with competition, it has nothing to do with the game that they're playing or their performance. They just are swept in this miraculous experience of how glorious everything is, usually in slow motion. It's so spectacular. So that's what you want to do with the Course. You want to get into the zone with the Course. You want to, to get so deep and so devoted in your practice that just like with the pianist or the violinist, they're not thinking when they're out on that stage. They're being used as an instrument. Anybody who's been to a symphony knows that. You, you hear that. You hear the music coming in such harmony. You see their concentration and their focus. And, and, and the zone means that they're relaxed, that they're being done through. It can be sung through, like with Netta. It can be playing an instrument. It can be movement, a movement exercise like with Tai Chi and, and many types of movement. It's, it's, a, it's an involuntary flow and movement where you are aligned with spirit. And that's really the next phase that A Course in Miracles is be, to be taken to. It's not meant to stay boxed up. It's not meant to be uh, thought of within an intellectual realm. The, sometimes I hear people in spirituality putting down 
the intellect and there's a lot of putting down of the intellect and, and I hear all this stuff about the head and the heart and as if the head's the intellect and the heart has all the answers and the head is the mind and the mind has to be lost or forgotten or get you got to get it get rid of it or something they just don't really understand how deep it goes but for example the the Greeks and all the great traditions here in Europe of, of philosophy and rationality even people oftentimes people associate rationality with the ego and I'm here to tell you that's not the case anybody knows that any system of logic if you studied any philosophy you know that any system of logic depends on your first assumption well, let me tell you, the system of rationality is not the problem. The system of rationality isn't the problem at all. It's spectacular. But if your system is logical and the ego is your first assumption, separation from God, your whole rational system is messed up. Because why? You have a faulty first assumption. But what if love is your first assumption. Like the Beatles said, all you need is love. Carol King, only love is real, everything else illusion. Okay, Carol, what if, what if love is the premise? What if love is the first cause? What if love is right there at the bottom of that entire rational system. That's why in A Course in Miracles it's so deep that Jesus will use phrases like reason will tell you and he's talking about the Holy Spirit when he says reason will tell you. I know that's not popular in a lot of spiritualities. Everybody wants to throw reason out and just feel the love David, just feel the love don't talk us, us, us about thoughts. Just feel the love. Well, I have to tell them that your feelings come from your thoughts and don't ignore your cognition and don't ignore those thoughts because all those feelings come from thoughts. And they say, yipes. I, I was trying to ignore those thoughts and pretend they didn't even exist, you know? And, oh, that's part of the head. Get out of your head, get out of your head. No, 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 no. Don't ignore thought. Jesus is telling us that Christ is an idea in the mind of God. God actually thunk us up. <laughs> so be careful <laughs> when you start to ignore thoughts and the power of thoughts because who you are is a thought in the mind of God. So don't downplay thoughts too much. Because in the end, you're going to be feeling a little foolish. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I was just going to feel my way back into heaven. Ooh. No. And what's underneath those thoughts? What is actually underneath those thoughts? Our beliefs. Your, your beliefs determine your thoughts. You can believe things about your thoughts. Wow, that's pretty important. You can even believe your thoughts are ineffectual. You can believe your thoughts don't mean anything. And ultimately, all egoic thoughts don't mean anything. <laughs> That's, these thoughts do not mean anything. That's a workbook lesson. But if you believe and you dismiss the power of thought, you are also dismissing the power of your mind. And believe me, even though I know Eckerd and Muji and all of them talk about, let go of the mind. Listen, this is Jesus Christ talking to us. You've got to lay aside all the things you've learned. And that's why I say don't mix metaphysics. Don't try to go mixing this with Advaita Vedanta. And don't try to mix this with a bunch of other pathways. There's a lot of pathways that talk about Christ consciousness. And in The Course in Miracles, Jesus says, Consciousness is the domain of the ego. Okay, now try putting those words together. Christ consciousness. Christ domain of the ego. Hmm? <laughs> so, we, this goes super deep. This is going to, I'm asking you now, 
you're going to have to, if you really give yourself over to this, I don't want you to start mixing in a bunch of other stuff that's extraneous because I will guarantee you if you do, you are bringing upon delay. And delay is unknown in heaven because there is no time, but it's tragic in time. When Jesus says in the I knew, do nothing section, he says, he talks about meditation, contemplation, fighting against sin, and he says these ways will succeed because of their purpose, but your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you, and this is a means of saving time. This is a way to slip past countless thousands of years of time. So, all I'm saying is, if you really want to wake up, and you really want to experience enlightenment and self-realization, and you happen to have stumbled upon, through the grace of God, A Course in Miracles, The Course in Miracles is like a diamond cutter. It's a, it can slice an ego as hard as a diamond. Just whoosh, whoosh. Now you can use a diamond cutter to cut a napkin. And you can use it to cut a tissue. But let me just tell you, you're not really making full advantage of the tool if you're going around cutting tissues and napkins with a diamond cutter. You know, that's, that's, if you could understand how foolish that is, if you're not giving yourself fully over to this amazing, spectacular tool, then you're just not using what's been given you to awaken to the fullest extent. And this is very, very important. So, in the larger context of things, I'm going to talk, and Francis and I are going to talk today about the new phase that we're moving in, because admittedly much in the first decades of the Course, it, it, much of it's been intellectual, but, and yet you could feel it in our dance party last night. That was no intellectual experience. That was spontaneous joy. That was erupting joy. And you know that feeling. And you probably have felt that feeling when you've watched certain movies or you've lis listened to certain songs and you feel transported. That's why I was emotional this morning listening to Instant Karma. Instant Karma is going to get you, it's going to knock you off your feet. You know, G John Lennon was talking about the holy instant in his beautiful way, and watching the wheels. Oh, I don't know if I'd have got through some of the darkest hours if I hadn't listened to watching the wheels. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. I really love to watch them roll. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. Do you know how important that song was in, in my experience? And to be able to play that song anytime I wanted to, when the ego chatter got loud, trying to tell me I was guilty and crazy. That's actually in the song. People think I'm crazy doing what I'm doing. Even that's in the song. Well, I tell them there's no problem, only solutions. That's a course in miracles. John is channeling his, son, his birthday, and I'm talking about him, but he's, he's channeling the ideas from the Course. That's why I was so touched. That's why this morning I was moved to tears in my meditation of the gratitude of how Jesus is using the Beatles and John and George and, and all these great gurus and saints and prophets and mystics and there is just, it's like a giant song of awakening and and we can be appreciative of that and also we can start to bring that in to our experiences with the Course in Miracles. Like I said, a Course in Miracles is like razor, razor sharp uh, metaphysics. There's your diamond cutter. More than razor sharp, it's, it's, it can cut a diamond. And that's a really compressed piece of coal. <laughs> that, that diamond is shiny and sparkly, but we don't want to follow the diamond. We want to follow that sm small, still voice within. Another thing I was reminded of today was I've got this thing called Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment and it's an amazing tool and it's online now, but there's one of the movies that came out some years ago, it was made in Australia, but you know how the, 
the matrix kind of got hold and caught hold and became like a, a sensation all over the world. The, there was a movie that was ki- kind of like The Matrix, except it was even more Course in Miracles than The Matrix, and it was so direct and to the point that people were telling me when it first was coming out, they said, David, you've got to see this movie. It's a, it's a major motion picture that's, that's a Course in Miracles acted out. And I was like, what, what, where, where? Let me go. And I remember going to the theater, like, the second day after it had opened in the town where I was, and I sat there, and there was only like five people in the theater, and my housemate, who's also into the course, went with me, and we were watching this movie with our eyes wide open and our mouths wide open, and we were doing high fives throughout the movie, and the movie was so dark, uh, it had huge metaphysics, but it was so dark, which if you stripped away all the pleasure and all the distractions of the world, this would be a pretty dark world <laughs> if you took away all the egos, ooh-la-la. La. Anyway, the movie was so dark that we were doing high fives because of the Course Principles, and the rest of the people in the movie were looking at us like <laughs> like they were watching some kind of an Alfred Hitchcock thing, and we, what are they doing back there? They're... We're going, whoa, man, high five. <laughs> All the way through the movie for two hours, you know, and the people were kind of huddled trying to make it through the movie. And we're in the back, you know, doing this because it just shows you it's all, it's all your perception. We were just so ready for that movie. It was called Dark, Dark City. But anyway, in this movie, Dark City, there's, an, there's a character, an, an inspector, Inspector Walensky, and Walensky is like a detective, so he's been pondering this murder cases and pondering everything that's going on in the movie, and he's studied it so well that basically he's come to the awareness that that there's no way out, that the whole world was designed that you would not escape. The world was made that you would never know who you are. So it's a closed system. So the body was invented, and time and space were invented, and everything about time and space was made by the ego that you would never remember who you are. Sometimes I call this world Distractionville. <laughs> oh, is it Distractionville? You know, you want options, not real options, but you want pseudo-options, you want pseudo-pursuits, you want to hide in the darkness so deep and wind yourself so deep that you'll forget the light? Well, that's what this world is. It's a, it's a major distraction. And I have to say, the five senses are all part of that. So in the movie Dark City, at some point, the main character, he keeps seeing these signs called Shell Beach, which is a brighter times. It's like a beach, it's light. In a very dark world, it's like symbols of light. It's kind of like in this world when people talk about heaven and nirvana. They're talking about something they hope is there, <laughs> right? I mean, if they had a direct experience of heaven or nirvana, they wouldn't be talking about it in a body. <laughs> they would be in the, in the bliss of eternal love and light. But everybody talks about heaven and talks about nirvana and, and samadhi and all these things, but but they're just hoping that these mystics and saints are right <laughs> about what they're talking about. This gives them hope for something brighter. Well, in the movie, Shell Beach is like this, this, um, this poster, this snapshot, this thing of, of brighter days on a beach. But the thing is, everybody talks about Shell Beach, and they know they all talk about Shell Beach, but no one can remember how to get there. It's just this thing that's talked about, but nobody remembers the way. Well, the reason nobody remembers this way, the way is because time and space was made to keep you into amnesia so that you would never remember your true identity as spirit. So the world is a giant, you might say, cosmic amnesia case, but it's not just partial amnesia. It's complete amnesia. So everybody who talks about heaven, even everybody who moves their little eyeballs on A Course in Miracles and reads the passages and goes, ooh, ooh, 
They, they're, <laughs> there's something powerful here, but, oh, it's still the world, you know. I still am interacting with the world. It's heavy. It's dark. That's why I needed a lot of heavy doses of John Lennon, <laughs> heavy doses of the Beatles, heavy doses of George Harrison. I even like the story of the Beatles because, you know, a lot of times we get into groups and we think, oh, groups are so wonderful and we've got our little Living Miracles group and MIC, Mick, Miracles in Contact group and da 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 You know, John left the Beatles. He, he formed another little group smaller than the Beatles. Instead of the Fab Four, it was called John and Yoko. <laughs> he went for a couple, couple size group. <laughs> and they worked out a lot of stuff too. You know, bed-ins. They did press conferences for peace, for world peace to draw attention to it. They did a lot of work. So did the Beatles. But what I'm saying is, it's not so much the form in which your earth life takes. It's actually being led by the purpose to be guided into an experience that will release the world from the chains of the ego mind. As you release the ego, you set all the captives free because this is a holographic universe and all those seven billion people are projections of the ego as well. You know, we think there's seven billion peoples out there and they all have private minds and private thoughts which goes against the total teachings of the Course, that all minds are joined. There's really only one of us. The name of us is Christ. And that's a God-given name. That's not an earthly name at all. You know, even the realms of the angels, those are symbols too, but, but they're symbols of comfort, of blessing, of come home to the light, of welcome home to the light, remember who you are. So it takes a lot of mind training to go into the next phase of the course, but we're moving into it now. It's wonderful. That dance, we were all feeling it, like, whoo, everybody's dancing around, it's very spontaneous, very involuntary. That was not choreographed. <laughs> that was not even planned. It just happened the night before John Lennon's birthday. <laughs> and we burst into the joy. So this next phase we're going into is a phase of surrender. I, I heard that today in, in the song Mind Games, you know, playing those mind games forever. It's, it's in the end, love is the answer, and you know that for sure. Yes is the answer. You've got to let it, you've got to let it go. He's telling us to let the world go and let the mind games the ego mind games, the attack and defense, He's, you got to let it go. And then he says, yes is surrender. Now he's even defining yes for us as surrender. Wow, John, <laughs> on your birthday, you, we're starting to really appreciate you a little more than we ever did. You were really giving it to us. We needed to hear that. That was Jesus singing through John Lennon and those beautiful lyrics to help us wake up. And we're moving into a phase where, where the study and the practice of the Course now, if you really are devoted with it, has to yield into an involuntary experience. Miracles are involuntary. Miracles should not be under conscious control. So we can't, like, intellectually kind of try to keep the lid on the miracles because the intellect is is just an aspect of consciousness, and that's going to the lid of the intellect will get blown off uh, into an experience. There is an experience that will come to end your doubting. There is an experience of joy, of supreme happiness that transcends death, that transcends sickness, that transcends separation, and we're getting ready to move into another phase of our work with A Course in Miracles. What Francis and I want to talk about this morning, Francis is saying a lot with her eyes. <laughs> she's, she's beaming and <laughs> all over the place. But what Francis and I are going to actually talk about <laughs> this morning is something that Gandhi knew about, 
uh, is something that Yogananda knew about, is something that uh, St. Francis knew about, is something that Mother Teresa knew about. But it's opening your mind into letting the Holy Spirit use, use the dream and the dream symbols, and even we'll call them the dream characters, uh, in ways that help accelerate your awakening. And that's the simplest way I can say it. Gandhi, you know, Gandhi, Gandhi was married and, and Gandhi had children, but Gandhi had, a, as he moved on in his life of nonviolence and his really devotion to peace, uh, he had a, a little community that was around him that were very much devoted to practicing nonviolence in their daily living with absolutely everything. And uh, Mother Teresa, you know, had a little, when she left uh, Albania and she went to India and she was on a train in India and she got her calling to work with the poorest of the poor, she established her first mother house in Calcutta. And that was just a group of nuns that practiced serving Jesus and trying to see the Christ in everyone that they met. Very high calling. St. Francis, you know, he left his rich life with his parents and he ultimately ended up leaving Assisi and going out to San Damiana with, to help rebuild a church and then there was a small little community that came to live with St. Francis. Bernardo and Giacondo, you know, some of you know the, some of the stories. And there's another beautiful being, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda who uh, came to the West from India, came to the West, and uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie of his life called Awake, but I would highly recommend it. But Paramahansa Yogananda, he came over to the United States, and the more I kind of looked into this movie and, and looked at that, I said, wow, Paramahansa and I had very similar pathways, because he went into these deep, states of mind, and then he spoke all over the place. He went touring, like I've been touring around 44 countries, he was touring all over the United States. He was touring in Washington, D.C. He was giving talks at, like at the, at major, the Capitol or White House, at, at going all over the place giving these amazing lectures about self-realization, um, I think starting off maybe back in, I don't know if it's the 20s, 30s, you know, he, he was some decades before me, but he was doing very much what I was doing, was, was letting presence just pour through him in as many circles as he could. He was, he would go wherever he was invited. Now, with Paramahansa Yogananda having passed on, there are Ananda communities all over the world where they live together and practice his deep teachings in a very devoted way. So, what I'm saying to you is, during the course of human evolution and involvement, you know, we have things like the nuclear family, father and the mother and the children, we've, nowadays, with same-sex marriages, and there are many different <laughs> uh, forms, many different configurations that people live together. But I'm not here to talk about the form of things. I'm not interested really in the form of things. I'm here to talk about what is the purpose. If, if the one choice you have left in your mind is the choice of purpose. I even wrote a little booklet called Purpose is the Only Choice. And why is purpose so important? It's because, like I shared earlier with you all, that only a single purpose can endow events with stability. Only a common single purpose can stabilize perception. Unless you have, unless you live your life by a purpose, and I'm not meaning every once in a while, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, peace, peace, oh yeah. No, it's not just like an occasional thing. When, when John was saying, give peace a chance last night, he's talking about purpose, like have that be in the front. I think for John, 
the purpose of peace became more important than selling records, more important than being a part of the Beatles, more important than anything. Uh, he, he found that that purpose was so dear to him, and it was very disturbing because he was still looking through the ego's lenses, and he was still seeing war, and war was horrifying to John. In fact, he and the Yoko spent thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to rent a billboard in New York City. Make love, not war. <laughs> okay. It, he, he really valued peace. In Course in Miracles terms, you could put the peace out in front, you can put the, you can call it love, you can call it forgiveness, but that purpose will determine your perception of the world. And that's why you have to consistently have that purpose out front. It's got to be your top priority. And I'm not talking about, you know, leave all behind and go live in a cave and meditate for 15 hours and leave your children behind. I'm saying, right in the midst of what you perceive to be your world, put that peace as the priority among all things. I'm talking about that inner peace, the peace of God, not world peace or anything like that, but, but that inner peace. And that's what I'm talking about. If you put peace first in your life, I mean in your mind too, you're fully, you have got to let the Holy Spirit then configure the characters. The, like if your daughter's there with the grandson or whatever, that's fine. But it has to be given from that purpose. The Holy Spirit has to be the one that's orchestrating the movements and the configurations because otherwise, I'll tell you, it's the ego still trying to maintain control and be in charge. Uh, be in control of the world. Control of who lives where and how long and who comes this and who does this. It's a mess. You, know, you, you won't find peace of mind by trying to control this world. In the Rules for Decision, Jesus tells us, you have no control over the world you made. Well, hallelujah, that's pretty clear. Thank God I have no control over the world I made. He's talking egoically. You invented this world and you can't control it. In fact, it's a prearranged script and you can't even change it. That's why you can't control it. It's destiny. It's destined. You can't fix the world. You can't change the world. Seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. And changing your mind means changing from hatred to forgiveness. The purpose. You have to have a new purpose to see a new world. To see with new eyes. To see, to realize who you really are. So, Emily gave a little bit of a hint about what we're up to here in Europe, I have to say, actually, um, it was probably toward the, the later part of last year when I started to to kind of feel that there was some, supposed to be some kind of center in Europe. And I was, again, okay, it's your plan, whatever you want. So I I came to Europe and I started moving around in in Western Europe and then and then went back to Mexico, and then I was called again to get on the plane again and come over, this time to Mallorca, Spain, an island in the Mediterranean. And, and sure enough, I met a family that remembered me from like eight years before. I didn't remember them. I didn't remember that part of the island. And all of a sudden, David! David, we love you! And like, because I meet... Thousands of people, thousands and thousands. And, I, and so this whole family is like loving me and hugging me. Oh, come to lunch with us. And oh, and then they take me to this place and they said, this was the house you, you rented from us uh, to do one of your six-week uh, devotional retreats. And then I saw the house. I went, oh yeah, I recognize that house. But that was, that was the most, it was like, oh yeah, I have been here. That is a house. I do see that. I remember that house. I remember those steps. And then they started saying, I said, well, we're here to get a center in Europe and everything. And they said, oh, we've got the place for you. And they had already sold this place, but 
they hadn't uh, signed the contract yet. And so Mama, the, the matriarch of the whole family, said, this is for David. <laughs> you forget that other potential buyer. That is not a potential anymore. And this one's for David. And so the daughter was like, okay, okay, Ma, whatever you want. You know, she's the matriarch. You know, and so, And then all these miracles started happening. Money was donated, people coming in, a car was donated. It's just like, it's almost like, you know, instant jello or an instant coffee mix where, you know, it's like, when it's, I've seen things move fast, but this was like moving super fast and it just coming in, coming in, coming in and wire transfers and this and this. And I mean, it was so complicated over here and, and yet I was like being carried. All of us were just watching. And at one point, it started to, uh, there were some lawyers involved in all these transactions. And then uh, the lawyers insulted the daughter of the family. And, and Jesus was saying, well, you're going to have to take some action here. And I was like, okay, what do you want me to do? He's like, fire the lawyers. Get them lawyers out. We have to have back heart-to-heart connections is what this is about. You get the legal people out of this. You're going to need some, but I'll send you, I'll send you what you need. So I was saying to some of my friends, I was saying, you know, I wish I had a notario over here, like the one I had in Mexico. And I love that one in Mexico, Luis. And then two days later, they called up and the family had found a notario and his name was Luis. And it was like Jesus said, I told you I'd send, send in what's necessary in terms of the legal stuff. You've got to leave that to me. So, and then eventually this center has unfolded. But more than that, because I kept hearing that this year for me was more of a year of Europe. And it has been unfolding that way, including all of this. You know, it's Jesus tells me ahead of time, you know, this is what's coming. So I'm not surprised. But what we really want to talk about this morning is <laughs> <laughs> meditation and <laughs> we want to talk about the context, the context of what spiritual community is because it's not a form as much as it is a devotion. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think the community is kind of you know developed um, really around David because I know David started his path on his own. Just he and Jesus and travel alone and go to homes wherever he was invited and go to course groups wherever he was invited. And then when people started to go around David and saying, I want to live with you. It wasn't like David said, I want to start a spiritual community. It didn't start like that. It was people came to him saying, I'm your students. I want to learn from you. And I actually want to live with you 24-7. And people started to just, just start to form around you with properties and different things. That was the start. And I really feel that is important because, because from the very beginning, this is a very clear focus that we are not leading the way with a plan or idea of how it's going to look. Because the whole purpose is we are going to be shown this whole life on earth in time and space if we're going to use, be, if that's going to be used to undo our entanglement or belief in time and space, we have to be shown. And we cannot really sort out the plan from within, within this realm of mind. So, so this is how it got started. David was clueless and was like, okay, a community is coming and people are living around. And, and he just continued to travel you know, continue to travel, and certain people say, I want to travel with you. So it just started 
like that, and more and more people um, came to live in a base where, whether he travels away or not, they just settled there. So I think then gradually um, a monastery, uh, Living Miracles Monastery, was donated by Suzanne um, in Utah, United States. That's where the first wave of um, of volunteers came to support. And I remember I was probably among that wave when we just got the monastery, it just opened, and I came. And it was the same. I didn't really come to, to live in community at all. I just finished a long ret retreat with David in Australia. They all left. And I really was looking at my life and how I was not myself. I could not really follow my calling. So I was really looking at all the situations and decided to make some, make some changes. And I made the biggest change, which was I was um, going to leave my marriage because I couldn't really be truthful to myself if we're going to stay together. There was, so that was the biggest but I was terrified after I made that decision. I was so terrified that I, I texted David and he was probably still have one more day in Australia that he was gonna go. I texted David, I said, I did this. And then he said, come down um, where we are, which was a few hours away from Sydney and just be with us for a day because they were leaving the next day. So I went down and I felt so bad in my heart, just like the dark, dark uncertainty about what did I, what have I done, what was going to happen. And at the end of the day, I just couldn't stand it. I just said, can I just spend some time with you, just a few minutes just to sit down, because I was just trembling. And then he said, welcome to visit us in Utah. So I thought, oh, okay, thank God, I have a next step. And I didn't come in until I made a huge move. So when, when I went to Utah, I was only thinking of three months. That's the only time I could stay in the United States, three months. And I thought by the end of the three months, I would finish my mind training. It was, it was just taking, you know, it's three months, mind training, that's a long time. So that's... That's that was probably nine years ago when I came. <laughs> uh, so that's that's really, and I I believe that was a lot of the, you know, we were in the same situation with a lot of the people who who came together in that time. We we felt called to receive mind training. That was really the only purpose we went there for. No, it's not our life. It was it was not intention to to do anything except just for ourselves. So gradually, I think it just continued on, continued on one thing after the next because, because Spirit kept giving me new assignments and new heart-opening and life-opening and mind-opening experiences. So I felt like I was expanding, expanding, expanding. There was nowhere else that I needed to go because I felt like even though I was living in the community, I wasn't really living in one place. I was continuously expanding and felt like the, com the community expanded with me together. So we were like a, just, that's, that's the experience. But the purpose is so important because if we go to a place and feel we're going to make something out of it, in terms of goals in time and space, then that is actually the total opposite of, of awakening. And that is not going to work. It's going to be a huge compromise of our calling. So, so, you know, you can imagine for we have people who come from different parts of the world and at, at any given time, um, the size 
always varies, you know, from year to year. Sometimes we have a lot of people all of a sudden. Sometimes we have a very small group, and people come from, you know, one week, one month to just indefinite. We 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 really don't know. But it was just all orchestrated. But I do say that David kept the purpose very very pure because it's very tempting to mix. Intentions and purpose. The moment you get into daily life, get daily living, and with a group of people, and we're talking about daily things, talking about projects. You know, when we do a retreat, we don't say whatever the result. You know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. No, when we when we receive the prompt to put a retreat, it is happening because there is an integrity underneath it. If spirit said. This is what we're gonna put out and what we're gonna do. We take steps, very, very specific steps, and we're not like, who knows? We don't know. Let's see. There is actually a difference. So, so when we come together, there, there are a lot of projects like this daily, day in and day out. So it's all kind of feeling the same. As living anywhere in the world, actually, in terms of how it looks. But the only difference, which is a huge difference, is the purpose is very, very single. And the moment temptations come up to mix the purpose and to split the purpose or change the purpose, it gets straightened out pretty quickly because it, it held. You know, very very sturdy, from David and from everybody's intentions. So, yeah, I, I really just feel it's it's important. We cannot talk about spiritual communities and how we live without talking about what is truly the foundation of it, because if we talk about what we do and how we do things, it, it's not really the message. It's not the picture. It, you know, the only reason that. We are living together is because of the purpose, and the only reason that we seem to be able to to continue on and advance in our spiritual awakening is because of this purpose. And this, the the only reason that I can share with you today, and all of us can have anything to share, is just because of this purpose. That's really there is nothing else to share except that. So. Yeah. So having said that, then we can talk a little bit more about the specifics. Yeah, and I, I just also want to lay the context that when you put the purpose out front to forgive, it is like you're handing over all attention, concern, worry about outcomes in the world. We're not. Talking about advocating a certain way of living. When you, when I think community, I think purpose. When I think community, I actually, th I think communion with the Holy Spirit. I think communion with Jesus is what I'm thinking of. I mean, holy communion, not taking bread and not from the Catholic system or the the church system, but but being in alignment. And sharing the same prayer, and letting the spirit guide, and that means giving over the concern for the form, and saying, "You give me if there's a word I need to speak, you give it to me. Somebody I need to meet, I'm happy. You, you tell me how, or you bring them to me. If I'm supposed to travel somewhere, then let's do it." You be you in charge. It's not about the boxes that I talked about at the beginning: categories, statuses, boxes. You know, I would I would rather have communion with you than have a status in the world. I would rather have communion with you, Spirit, rather than be identified with a with a country. You know, that's John Lennon again. Imagine, imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can. There, that's what the Holy Spirit was telling me—the same thing. 
that John was sharing in his song. Imagine there's no country. That's an artificial construct, you know, American and German, and Australian, you know, it's like, and languages, you know, those, those are artificial. You know, there's a language of the heart, there's a language of, of, the, of the unified mind, there's a language of the spirit, and it takes us into this divine silence where we just are perfect. You know, it's just isness. There's nothing, there's not even words in that pure beingness. So, all I wanted to do is say, you guide my words, you guide my interactions, you guide everything, it's all yours. And that's why we are not advocating a particular form. I could not advocate a, f advocate a form when the parable of David has been filled with so many different forms. I mean, after I received A Course in Miracles in 1986, it was very intimate, but it was so intimate that I would just pop it open as like an oracle, I would pray, have a question, pop it open, get my answer, it happened over and over, month after month, and then Jesus said, I can do it with, watch, we do it with the radio too, pray, ask your question, now you're in your car, turn the radio on. Oh my God, he said no. See that sign over there? Oh, let's go to the library, you don't even need A Course in Miracles, I'll pray, ask your question, walk through the rows of the library, I'll tell you where to stop, you reach up, you pull a book open, you pop it open, oh, oh, it was like, Okay, I see. I see. You're in charge. You, I pray for the answer and you're going to give it to me. In, in a song on the radio, in somebody speaking to me, in a billboard. I mean, it's going to come flooding into me if that's my prayer to be shown, to be guided, to be led. I don't, I'm not limited by the Course. I mean, it's going to come everywhere. And so for me, that's the purpose, and the purpose goes in line with the, with the prayer of the heart. I'm more interested in all of us praying together, and not praying together just with words, but getting in, like we're on the same channel, we're all tuned in, our, our minds are all connected to the same purpose. So it's like a dance, like we had last night. Imagine your daily life being like that dance that we experienced. So spontaneous, so just joyful, so happy. Not a care in the world. We're just swaying and moving and running and we're being, it's like played with the spirit, you know. We're just, we're just totally, to me that's what community is. That's what communion is. And, and then another line from Imagine, that song, Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. Well, we're not into ritualistically trying to say, okay, you, no possessions, no possessions. Because no. we know that possessions are in the mind, right? The ego is the possessive part of the mind. But if you start to trust and you start to flow and let the spirit orchestrate things, then you start to realize that everything in this world is a backdrop. I'm not advocating a certain way that people should be or a certain form because in 1991 I said, okay Jesus, what's next? And you've heard of like maybe the Aborigines in uh, Australia, Marla Morgan's book, uh, when she goes on walkabout in the, in the Aborigines. Well Jesus said, we're going to do a little driveabout. And I said, okay, I don't have a car. He said, well, I'll take you to, you know, we'll go to the car dealership and uh, you've got how much money? Okay, we'll get you a look. He got me a little gold three-cylinder little, it was really good. The price of gas back in 1991 <laughs> was very cheap. And he got me a three-cylinder car, which could pretty much run on fumes. I, I very rarely had to fill the car up. I'd fill it up and then drive across states, across the United States. Could go for miles and miles and miles on this little thing. And Jesus said, yeah, we're going on a little driveabout. And actually that driveabout actually lasted five years. That's the thing with Jesus leading the way. You just, you know, you think you're going on a trip. And it's a trip. 
It's a mind trip. Uh, we're going on a trip. He didn't really tell Helen Shuckman what was coming. <laughs> he didn't tell Judy. He never tells any of us where it's going because we'll get too frightened. But he just gives us little morsels like breadcrumbs. Here you go. Just follow the breadcrumbs. You know, that's all. Just the next breadcrumb. That's all you got to focus on. Here, the next breadcrumb. So he took me out for someone who didn't even like to travel, yeah, on a five-year trip. Uh, that really washed that one away. And then I was taken in and met these people all over. I had so many miracles. And that was the form that initially it took. After just reading the book, studying the book, using the book as an oracle, and being very devotional, I didn't even know of course groups at the beginning. I didn't even know there was such a thing as Course in Miracle groups. All I know is I was having a very deep, intimate experience with Jesus, and that was all I needed. I didn't even have to think about groups. And then when I started traveling around for five years, I met a lot of people in groups. Um, some groups welcomed me in. I went to one group, a Course group, and they had a set of bylaws, and and they had to take a vote whether I could speak at the group. And I was like, whoa. And Jesus is like, I'm teaching you to be present with me. You do not need to be concerned about rules and groups and everything like this. Stay with me. That's the goal here. Uh, don't judge anything. I was invited one year to, to a conference um, where I was going to be a speaker and the minister set up a session with the whole group where it was myself and another minister and another minister holding a stopwatch. And I was like, okay, never seen this one. Well, the, the guy, the minister with the stopwatch would give like the first person like a minute or two minutes to speak and then time and then there would be like, it was set up like a political debate except this was about spiritual awakening and enlightenment. So I remember talking. David, you can go. Somebody asked a question from the audience about enlightenment. I would get talking, 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 and then in mid-sentence. And so one of the most important things to remember as you're on your spiritual journey is ding, time. <laughs> Jesus closed my mouth on time, even if I was in mid-sentence, because that was the format that was given. And I was not to try to buck the format. I was to be there in happiness and joy and stay attentive. And if that was the rule that was given, then I would stop right on the stopwatch. Well, there were some people in the audience that were quite upset. <laughs> and there was a lot of people shaking things, all kinds of things going on. And this went on until... Finally, I said, I know Jesus is going to have some fun with this because uh, he always does. He's so playful. He uses anything to, to make it playful and joyful. This went on for some time. Finally, my time to speak, I was speaking and I was speaking and it went on in a joyful way. And the guy holding, the minister holding the stopwatch was not, was not stopping me. I was way beyond the time until the other minister said, hey, 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 what's going on here? <laughs> David is way over time. He interrupted the whole thing. This is not great. You know, what's going on? And then the minister with the stopwatch said, I know. David mentioned my name in his answer. I felt to give him as long as he wanted to speak <laughs> with a total straight face. <laughs> he says this. Well, the whole audience burst into laughter. The minister next to me burst into laughter. The minister with a stopwatch. And everybody was bursting with it because Jesus was playing with the time idea, showing us we don't need to be so attached to time and rules. And I, I always know Jesus is going to use whatever the situation is for lightness, for joy, for happiness. As long as I have no investment 
in anything. I can experience it with Jesus. But if I have an investment of the outcome based on time beliefs or expectations, whatever, then I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to, going to be stirred up. So that's part of what we focus on so much. It's not just a group of people spending time together, but it's, it's the purpose, it's the prayer underneath that is so important. That's why even for me at the very beginning, when I, when I first took some of, my, some of my early trips in 1989 and 1990, Jesus actually took me on a trip and he said, I will take you on a trip to meet people who have dedicated their whole lives to A Course in Miracles. And it was so helpful actually. You know, I was up there with Ken Wapnick. I was out there with Robert Perry. I was meeting people that today, many of them are still friends and, and we still are working with the Course. This is decades later. And it was actually helpful for me to be around people who had given their whole life just as a witness to Jesus saying, look at this. You see, this is possible. That's pretty much the way the community is evolving because you do have those who have given their whole lives to this very dedicated purpose and to living a very prayerful life, not a casual life, not not a, a, a sporadic, a uh, little bit of this, a little bit of that, but really a very devotional life. And I think we feel there's some kind of, there is a synergy, there is a quickening, there is an acceleration and we are moving into another phase, I think, because we're simply following the prayer. And I like w when you said surrender, because um, once the, the purpose is clear, and once that is a shared purpose, then the next phase um, for us in community is really we're surrendering together. And there is nothing else for us to really decide on except through prayer with the Spirit. And there are so many, so many examples of how we live, you know, from big decisions like centers in Spain, centers in Mexico, centers in the United States. The reason that, you know, we were so rejoiced that this center in Spain came in it was because it came in through Jesus, through a miracle. It was really not happening. We didn't make it happen. We, we know we didn't make it happen. David came here, and then he went back to Mexico. And actually, there's a, a little bit, maybe you didn't know, but um, two friends were left here in Europe to continue when David first went back to Mexico. And they went to this house in Mallorca, just just to drive by and just to have a look because that house o was already sold, marked it was already sold, but they had no other houses to look at anymore, and they were heading back as well. So that was the last stop. So they said, let's just have a holy encounter with the family and see what we, you know, have a good time, and then we go. They went to the house and they had such an amazing time with the family, and the family invited these two friends for dinner and asked the f um, one guy who, who actually felt the call to, to, to donate a center for David, uh, for Living Miracles Europe. And so he was part of the search team and then he was, he was speaking Spanish. He was speaking Spanish because the family only spoke Spanish. So they were speaking in Spanish and Suddenly they were really excited, and then they asked, so Frank, tell us, what do you do? What, what is your life about? And so he said, oh, yeah, I have this journey, and I'm all oh, about forgiveness now. So he shared what is important to him, and the family, the mother, the head of the family said, you just remind me of this man I met 10 years ago. His name is David Hofmeister. That's how... In Spanish. In, <laughs> Spanish. in Spanish. That was actually how... So the two friends was completely stunned. They were like, what? 
David Hofmeister and then the, the family were they were stunned too. You were looking for a center for David Hofmeister's community, so that's how then David got called back and all of this just flourished. But that was somehow we know we heard to come to look for a center. But Jesus said, even that, I have the center for you. And it's not even for you to make your effort. And that is how all the other center came in as well. Every single center came in with this huge miracle synchronicity and story, one after the next, one after the next. And even recently I was in England and other presenters were telling me, saying, oh my God, I was just telling my husband about the center in Mexico, how mirac miraculous. I said, well, there's another one. <laughs> the Spain just came in. So it was just one after the next. But, but this is truly, um, yeah, for us, we, we come together, we hold the, the purpose steady, then we pray and we learn to hear the one voice together, then we just step back and allow the, the miracles to be orchestrated, and then we go, really go where we were pointed to, you know, not fight. We, we don't fight. Okay, no, I have an idea. It has to be. We would love to have a center in Europe from 10 years ago, and it, it was like, but it wasn't what we want. It wasn't the time. It wasn't, it was all about what God's will is because, because only in that then we, we taste happiness. And only in that we find out who we are. So that is how it seems to unfold. This community just unfolded in different countries, different locations, and with different people that, that were sent to us. So, yeah, it's just, that's the, the bigger decisions, seemingly the bigger decisions around the steward of the money that come in and the center that come in. But there are also a lot of small decisions, but really um, the essence of all of them are the same, you know. Hold steady the purpose, pray together, and allow ourselves to be shown. Yeah, I, could, I could definitely relate with Jack in the movie last night because I started studying the course and then my parents are as wacky and quirky <laughs> as, as mom and dad there. And I'm coming back from my Course in Miracles gathering and I'm all excited and, you know, you walk into the living room and, and you know, they weren't quite ready. <laughs> for whatever I was going to share. Like, this family wasn't quite ready for let it be. Let it, let, let him be. <laughs> you know, but leave it be. I mean, they, they couldn't even remember the name. And he's like, gosh, come on, this is, you're the first people on earth. And that's how I felt. You know, it's like, I've just read A Course in Miracles and I've got said, and they were not, you know, they were about as receptive as Jack's parents. And then as we get deeper into it, you know, it's like, like when you read that line in the Course where Jesus says, if you will be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. How many of us grew up in families where our parents would say to us as little children, now you be a good miracle worker because Jesus will orchestrate time and space for you. You don't have to worry about grades. You don't have to worry about your classmates bullying you. You don't really have to worry about your school lunch, you know. Somebody took your school lunch and you could only eat a Snickers bar three days in a row. That's okay. Jesus, don't worry. Nutrition, don't, don't worry about nutrition. Jesus will orchestrate time and space for you if you do the, the miracle working. None of us had that. And I'm like everybody else. That is not what we were talking about at our dinner table. My sister would refuse to eat certain things, lima beans or certain things, and she would get into a war where she would refuse and they would say, no dessert for you and you're not leaving the table, and she refused to eat. And it was like World War III uh, at the table. We weren't talking about Jesus 
and miracle working and, and love and acceptance and trust and don't worry about your nutrition and the body and just be a good servant of Jesus. You know, that was the farthest thing. So when I started reading the Course and I started reading that he would orchestrate time and space for me, it took me, I started to get a lot of synchronicities like Carl Jung talked about the first four or five years with the Course. There was huge synchronicities. And then when I, just when I thought I was getting amazed by all the synchronicities happening in my world, and I'm like, okay, I, this is, I'm, okay, I believe, I trust, I understand, I'll, I'll follow. Then Jesus is like, no, you ain't seen nothing yet. Like the Bachman Turner Overdrive song. But ba ba baby, <laughs> baby Davy, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. It's like, here's something you're never going to forget. He's like, come on the road with me. And you want to see synchronicities? I'll knock your socks off. I'll, I'll blow that hat off your head. If you think those little synchronicities, those last few years with the course were something, let's go out on a road trip and get you away from your environment. I'll, I'll get you places to stay. You'll meet the most wonderful, happy people. They'll take you into their home because I will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except your only purpose, the only purpose you would fulfill. There's that purpose again. Let the purpose be out in front. Stay with me and watch. You're going to go on a magic carpet ride and you're going to see a whole new world and a, f a f new fantastic point of view. You're going to see that. Well, that was amazing. As soon as I was on the road, it, it was just absolutely spectacular. And I, I would start to share about my miracles at course groups. And sometimes even in course groups, people would look at me like with disbelief. Like, what? Are you sh is this a joke or something? Where do you work? You know, who do you work for? I said, Jesus? Oh, you know, you know it, it, it's, I, this was at the course groups. And then I'm going around and I'm sharing the miracles as I'm experiencing them. And, and they're kind of like, hmm, it sounds like a fairy tale to me. And, and I had to say, yeah, it does actually feel more like a fairy tale than a trip. Because, you know, when we're reading the fairy tales, isn't it great when you're reading all the fairy tales, Cinderella and Snow White and all these fairy tales, you know, they just kind of glide from scene to scene. They're never seeming concerned about money. They're never checking their, their balance in their checking account. You know, they're... Even the scenes where they cook food, you know, no, they just go into the scene, the food's on the table. You know, they don't even cook the food. They just jump from scene to scene. And that's how it felt for me. I'd, I'd walk into these houses of people I'd never met, and they, here, mi casa, su casa, take whatever you want from the fridge. I'm going, the first time I, I went, on the second day out on my first road trip with Jesus, I walked in on the last five or ten, ten minutes of this Course in Miracles group that I was guided to. And I didn't even want to go in because I'm looking down at the paper. I'm saying, no, it's over. Jesus, it's over. It's, it's only ten minutes left. And he said, get in there. And I'm like, I'm not walking into a course group that I've never been to. I've never met the people. In the final ten minutes, it says 11 to 12. It's ten minutes to 12. He said, get in there. So then I go in there. They're having this wild discussion about sexuality and they don't even notice I'm there. It's such a heated thing that's going on. And then at the end, at 12, oh, time's up. Where did you come from? <laughs> you know, Jesus kind of slipped me in in stealth mode. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with the topic. You know, they were all heated about the sexuality. <laughs> they weren't just a dry passage. They were really into it emotionally. And then... Then I was invited to lunch with all of them. Then the man who, I'll pay for lunch, and then come to my apartment, my, my condominium. And then a total stranger, never met the guy before, except at this course, 
Oh, I've got some things I got to do this afternoon. You stay in my apartment. Go use the tennis courts, swimming pool, jacuzzi, take whatever you want from the fridge, and I'll be back in four hours. Take a nap if you want. And, and Jesus was like, this is what I'm talking about, you know. I said I would take care of you in the most glorious way, and, and this, in your terms, it's a stranger that you've never met. And he's just opened up his house. He comes back in about four hours. Well, young man, you seem to know a lot about the Course. I'm going to call my Course of Miracles group up. I've got a houseboat. Let's do a potluck. And I'll get my whole Course group and we'll go out sailing on this lake. Off we go, doing a picnic on the lake. I'm like, Jesus, my gosh, this is like the second day out. And, and Jesus is like, I told you I'd knock your socks off. Uh, and and that's what we need because of our fear level, because of like the jack, because of the resistance is high. You need people around you, loving you, encouraging you, giving you things, you know, the things that would encourage you to go on this mission. This was at the beginning of, of my life's calling, and Jesus was like pulling out all the fireworks. It was like a Beatles concert. It was just full of everything. And then it just, that was the second night out. It just continued and continued and continued. And it still continues because, like Francis was saying, with every place we go, with all the people we meet, with all the synchronicities, with everything that comes in to serve, it's just loaded with miracles. So the whole experience of the dream becomes a miraculous experience. Everyone you meet, it's all purposeful. It's, there's nothing out of place with it. There's nothing that you, you say, wasn't that boring? No, it's miraculous is, is the word for it. And you have to adjust in your mind to living miraculously. That's what Jesus says in the Course. He, he says, I want you to be consistently miracle-minded. He doesn't want us to be jaggedly jumping back and forth between egoic states and right-mindedness, wrong mind and right mind. He wants us to be consistently right-minded, consistently miracle-minded. And prayer is the medium of miracles. The way that we reach this consistent miracle-mindedness is to be in, in prayer. I remember one time years ago, too, I... I we were going to Salt Lake City, and I said, uh, well, while we go to Salt Lake City, why don't we go to the the Temple Square where the Mormons are? And they have all this acreage and a big temple and Mormon tabernacle choir, and I thought that'd be fun. So I go on to the grounds, and there's these Mormon missionaries, men and women. They're all dressed a certain way. I'm, there's swirls of them. There's hundreds of Mormon missionaries that are all around me. And I'm, oh, I'm in heaven. I'm just like, look at all these dedicated young people all over the place. They go all over the world, and I'm swirled. They're all around me. So I'm walking through, walking through, and finally this one really dedicated Mormon missionary, I think she's from Canada, she saw me and a group of people that were with me walking through, and she came right up, and she looked right into the eyes of everybody in the group. And she went one by one into the people. She said, will you pray with me? Will you pray with me? She went around the group, will you pray with me? And different people that were with me had different reactions. You can only imagine <laughs> somebody with these shiny eyes, with this very firm, will you pray with me? They went, she went around, and then she came around, and I was the last one, and she came over to me, and she said, Will you pray with me? She looked me right in the eyes, and I said, I pray unceasingly. She went, Ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's what she was wanting. I pray unceasingly. Prayer is not an activity. Prayer is not a start. There's no starting point and stopping point. If you're just throwing up a few prayers here and there in your life, you're not really using the power of prayer and you're not really tapped into the power of your heart and your mind. 
I, I said, I pray without ceasing. She said, ah. That was just like the perfect thing for her. And then we started talking about Jesus. Uh, well, I can talk about Jesus. And, the, <laughs> and they loved to talk about Jesus. And so there was a, a joyful synergy there. That was a good topic. Jesus orchestrated that topic on, on, on Temple Square. That was a very good topic to go into. Parts of Europe, no. It's not the best topics. But I can talk about quantum physics and you know, the mind and psychology. And Jesus always gives me the perfect words for whatever. Eastern philosophy, yeah. I've kind of been through all those things, so Jesus just uses all the vocabulary depending on who I meet, depending on what the miracle receiver has the capacity to hear. And then we go our way rejoicing. Only because I'm in the prayer and because Jesus is orchestrating the encounter. That's why the encounters are so joyful. It has nothing to do with technique. It has nothing to do with practice. It's actually devotion to be in the prayer and to be consistently miracle-minded. And then everything flows from there. Now we are going to shift into... <laughs> We could talk, you mentioned more uh, specifics and logistics. Do we want to kind of shift into that? We've got time. Sure. <laughs> okay. We're just giving the underpinnings here. We're having fun. But now we want to talk. Because actually I know already, Francis, this is why we're talking about this, is because we were having breakfast this morning and Francis said that various people started coming up with her and started bringing up questions like like their life, like where they are at in their life, like like next steps in their life. Uh, these are you see how we bring it down to practicalities. You know, if that's the questions that Francis is getting, then I said, well, that's probably what we need to talk about. If that's what's happening, Jesus is sending these people to you for. A, a purpose. It's after we have our swirling dance and our great movie last night, there still comes the time of bringing things back t down to the most practical and the most basic level, which is still involves your decisions, your day-to-day -day decisions. We can't just talk about high ideas without talking about the practical. And so I feel like that was a pretty strong sign when you told me today you were having people coming up to you. Do you have any <laughs> anything that comes to mind from that? <laughs> well, um, yeah, the, the questions, I think we have different questions around, you know, it's, it's very common actually we notice in retreats like this, just the fact that you're willing to step out from your life, um, and a lot of a lot of the people actually feel like this is a transition phase, and there is a next step coming, but it's un unknown what the next step would be, how it's going to be different. But it feels like already feel it's it's there. It's not going to be the same. Something is going to be different, and s also I will have a quite a f number of people come to myself and Emily about uh, the center in Mallorca because we mentioned it in our opening. So just how how is that going to work? You know, I think there are probably very specific and practical questions in mind. Um, yeah, so I feel I feel open to just talk a little bit about about living in community and I think Emily could even talk a little bit more even just around where the center is at right now and um, whether we're open to devotional stays and those kind of things. How does that feel? Yeah. It feels good because a lot of times when people come up and they say uh, tell us about your center we can share the miracle experiences of how it came in. We can share that it's kind of been brought to us and it's come into our awareness, but it's not it's not like a concrete fixed thing because nothing in this world is what it seems. 
you know, we have to remember that this is a dream. And just like Carl Jung would talk about dream symbols, we're talking about dream symbols. So when we're talking even about a center, even though it is, it is a property, it's like it's, it's not a concrete thing. It's a potential that is going to be used by Jesus in some very helpful way. Like the movie we saw last night, were dream symbols and it, our hearts opened and we sang and we danced and Jesus had a fun time with all the dream symbols. It's more important to start to think in terms of even life decisions, what seem to be life decisions, as, as in a quantum way, like, like the symbols are just there and you're just awaiting the guidance of the Spirit to, to use the symbols in a way that will open your heart up and will lift your mind up into this beautiful celestial realm of, of miracles. So even with the center, we were just watching, watching, watching as it seemed to come and there's many holy encounters and there's, and I guess Emily will be able maybe this afternoon even to, to talk more specifically about a lot of things, but there's been many, many, many miracles with it. But even with the center, we are open and praying and, and asking to be shown how it's to be used. Is it to be used for uh, mind training in, a, in devotional stays and living that way? Is it to be used for spiritual retreats? Uh, it's interesting that there's an airport on the island that has a lot of non-stop direct connections to major cities throughout Europe. So it would be possible even to fly in on a Friday afternoon and fly back on a Sunday without missing work or much work, you know, to come in for like a splash, one of these things, only a weekend splash. We're just open. For us, everything is potential. And we're just saying to the Spirit, show us what you want. What would be most helpful in the context of of all the Beloveds here in, in Europe? And that's why we actually share these things too, is because if we meet you and you say, oh, here's an idea I had, or this or that. It's a collaborative venture. Just like with, with Mick, with Miracles in Contact, it's been a collaborative adventure. Just like with, with Coase and Doris, uh, mentioning this idea. There, there's this beautiful seed and look at this, the fruit of the seed is so beautiful. But it, it's like these are like little potential seeds that flower and flourish when we put them under the control of the Holy Spirit and Jesus. The ego, we're not interested in the ego's purposes for a center. We're not interested in the ego's purposes for a retreat or even, I mean, I wouldn't even want to go have lunch or have a coffee if it was from ego purposes. It would be, what, what's the point of that? You know, it's like, have a cup of coffee for what? But if I'm going there, I, I expect the whole purpose of the whole universe to be there with me in that cup of coffee. And that's going to light the holy, holy encounter up to make it something truly meaningful and helpful. So that's a, that's a big thing for us. You know, the purpose has to be in front because, you know, there's a part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus said, there is one question you can safely ask with any situation or circumstance. What do you think that one question, there is one question you can safely ask with any situation, circumstance. What is it for? The purpose. He's, that's the one question you can safely ask. And I know a lot of you have been asking that question, maybe with this retreat. <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> or uh, maybe with your room situation. Or <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> what is this for? But when I was in university for 10 years, I would had all these classes and coursework, but I would walk in the giant woods next to it and I would, I remember just conversing with spirit and, and, and I had all these conversations with Jesus. Like I'd say, you know, this is like my 10th year of full time in university. 
and Jesus would say, yeah, what's that for? <laughs> and I'd be like, it's education. It's, it's, it's important. Well, what's that for? Why is, why is that important? Why is education important? I said, well, you know, it's nice to pick up some degrees. What's a degree for? Well, a degree helps you get a better job so you get more money so you don't spend your whole life flipping burgers at McDonald's. So he's like, hmm, sounds like you make that pretty important. So, so yeah. And so, what's the money for? Why do you need more money? And I was like, a better standard of living. And he's like, really? So you think more money gives you a better standard of living? Yes, I do. And you know, this is the kind of conversations we would have. And then, then I would get to, no, it's like, he said, there really has to be, why would you want this money to do all this 10 years of university for some money that hasn't even arrived yet? What are, you know, what's this for? And I, he said, it's got to be more than the standard of living. He's like, all right, I said, I, I want a relationship. You can't be in a relationship and have no money. Nobody wants to be in the relationship with someone who has no money. He said, really? You believe that too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, who's going to pay? Who picks up the tab? You know, so I need the money for a relationship. So he worked at the... What's the relationship for? Why do you even need a relationship? What is the purpose of a relationship? I said, intimacy. And he said, oh yeah, so you believe you need bodies for intimacy. He's like, I'm not enough, huh? So you need those bodies <laughs> for, and you need the money to perpetuate the bodies to generate the intimacy. You know, this is the kind of what is it for that you get into with your higher self, with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus. Because that what is it for is a pivotal question. And that helped me actually loosen from academia because after 10 years, believe it or not, I was offered a scholarship and I was offered a doctorate program after 10 years of university. But thank heavens, Jesus had got me going with the what is it for. <laughs> so Jesus intercepted that. <laughs> Now I'm here instead of <laughs> Dr. Hoffmeister. <laughs> and that choice has made a lot of difference actually in my life, <laughs> my happiness. <laughs> that's, that's the joke, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's another, like in yesterday, that's a whole other parallel universe that I didn't go down this time. <laughs> <laughs> I see a hand going up. Do we have a roving? Jesse's got a roving mic. It's back. You hold your hand up again, and Jesse will see it. You have to talk and and use it and almost like a ice cream cone, you have to kind of hold them like this, like you're going to take a lick off of an ice cream cone to make it work. Yes, this is a live mic now coming your way. Okay. 
Hello. Um, may I ask, in relation to yesterday, um, our friend who was suffering from body hurts and pain, um, what is the difference between conscious mind and subconscious mind? Because we create this creation, uh, we create this creation, and I would like to know why it is that some people have this amazing amount of suffering in the body. I was told it was the, from the subconscious. Is there a difference? Well, for many years I've been sharing the idea that no one in their right mind would choose to suffer. And no one in their right mind would choose pain. And actually, no one in their right mind would choose to die. I mean, imagine if that was a decision. If you could choose to be immortal or be eternal or not, that's also a decision in the mind, as well as pain and, and suffering. So, when people go through this spiritual awakening and healing, it can occur, like for example, in 12-step programs, which basically deal with many different forms of suffering and many different forms of addiction, that the underlying core addiction is judgment. Because I shared yesterday that, that God didn't create judgment. Oneness doesn't create judgment. There's nothing to judge between in, in absolute perfect oneness. So you might say that there are subconscious beliefs and those are just beliefs that, are, that have been pushed out of awareness that are kind of running the show, so to speak, in terms of the world. So that even with bodily symptoms and even what seems to be suffering with with regard to the body, or pain with regard to the body, this is, this can be an unconscious decision that has been pushed out of awareness. And when decisions are pushed out of awareness, they become subconscious. So they're still operating, but they're not in awareness. And you might say that the point of all spiritual awakening and, and healing is to make the subconscious conscious. So in the end, the goal is to be fully conscious or to be aligned with spirit, which can actually take you even beyond consciousness then. Because I said consciousness is within the domain of the ego. And consciousness can be trained. Spirit can't be trained because spirit just is. You know, it's like Byron Katie saying, love what is. You know, that's, spirit is beyond training. And spirit doesn't have any levels except the levels of the Trinity, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which are all of spirit. They're just they're different aspects of pure spirit. So, the goal is to raise everything up and to become fully conscious. And that's why when the mind becomes fully conscious that everything, including what seems to be the point of death or laying aside the body, is becomes a conscious decision. I, I use the example of Paramahansa Yogananda, where he has his last supper, so to speak. He was speaking at a conference and he was with a lot of his devotees and beloveds and then he just said, well, thank you all, it's been nice. And poof, he seemed to exit the body, and the body remained in a state of non-decay for weeks. It was a beautiful symbol of this consciousness. But even the point of what people would call death, is he, he let that become a con conscious decision. There was another famous uh, monk named Thomas Merton, and... Um, he was just a beautiful man and he was so open-minded and then he he was at a monastery in, in Kentucky, near Bardstown, Kentucky, the Abbey of Gethsemane, and then he 
toward the end of his life, he took this trip over to India, and I think he was going to the Far East. I believe he was going to Thailand, and then somebody recorded his last talk that he gave before he laid aside the body, and I got to listen to the last talk. And as I was listening to the last talk, I, I could like feel he was saying it in so many words. He was saying goodbye. Uh, and then he finished the talk. He said, let's all go have a Coke, have a Coke. And then I had that strong feeling. And then he went and he seemed to be electrocuted <laughs> when a fan tipped over <laughs> in his room where there was some water. And, and that was that. It's another what it, it was another symbol to me about it's all is it a subconscious decision or is it a conscious decision? Even seeming exiting the body can be a conscious decision. So pain is when people feel pain, the immediately the ego projects it to the world that this is wrong or that's wrong or this organ's failing or this disease or this condition or whatever. Those are all projections. Uh, sickness is a decision. We learned that from Lesson 136. Sickness is a decision when the mind is too afraid of the light and too afraid of the loss that it believes the light would bring. It would rather elect to choose a symptom or pain or whatever than it would surrender to the light. And therefore it is it is making a decision in the mind but oftentimes it is out of awareness. It's it's like a quick forgetting. Even though there's even a selection of this very symptom, the mind practices its amnesia. It pushes it out of awareness. It forgets. Jesus calls it a quick forgetting. And that's why we talk all the time about raising the darkness to the light and and letting all the false beliefs come up. That's why we talk about mind training. That's why in our centers we're asking people to bring things to the surface. If you feel upset, don't stuff it down. At least talk about it. At least allow yourself. Or like Netta's voice liberation, she's like saying, let voice, let the sounds come out of what you're feeling because it helps you get in touch with your feelings. And the more in touch you are with your feelings, which is like barometers, then you can get more in touch with underneath, what's underneath the feelings, the thoughts and the beliefs. And that's how you clear, or you might say, empty out the sub subconscious. So thank you for that, that question. I, I have actually, not only have designed diagrams, I've asked Jesus for a map of the mind, and he gave me a, a concentric ring map of what's going on in the mind, and he gave me exact diagrams. But I've actually designed questions, uh, like uh, it's called Instrument for Peace, and now the Instrument for Peace has been turned into an, uh, a, a bot online uh, called Spiri, your spiritual assistant. So people interact on Facebook with a bot that's designed on unwinding their unconscious belief system by simply starting out by how they feel and then the bot takes them in almost like a Socratic dialogue. It takes them deeper into the mind to get in touch with the thoughts and the beliefs and the feelings. So it, it does that. And now we've put it into an app for your phone. So if you're not on, on the internet, you're out in the woods, you got an upset coming up, you can go into Spiri there and work through with Sperry. And now they tell me they've even hooked it up with Google Talk. So you can get the app and you can get Google Talk app and you can talk to your phone. And the phone says, how are you feeling today? It calls you by your name and then you go, well actually I'm not feeling very well. And it's like, oh. And, and then it starts, it's a dialogue with your phone. <laughs> to go into your mind to undo your subconscious beliefs by talking back and forth with this uh, app on your phone that's based on and programmed with the instrument for peace and the levels of mind and all the work I've been doing for the last couple decades. So 
believe me, if you're willing to go down and to get down at what's underneath these these decisions that are in the subconscious, there's a lot of opportunities, certainly for all of us, and there's a lot of tools and resources available for that too. Can these miss? Thank you. And can these misfortunes or um, illnesses be used to our advantage? I mean, in at one moment, can they? Yeah, I mean that's really what the course is about. We experience things in this world. We may judge them as lucky or unlucky. We may judge them as fortunate or unfortunate. Uh, but basically, we need a lot of clearing of that subconscious to be able to calmly look upon the world with the perspective of the, the Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, the world is a projection of our beliefs and our thoughts and our feelings. And we have to do a, a massive overhaul, a massive clearing. When you get to the workbook of A Course in Miracles, which is a spectacular tool for doing this, this is Jesus' experiential laboratory, is the workbook in A Course in Miracles, what he says is that these thoughts are designed to reverse the thinking of the world. So, the whole ego belief system is that things in the world and things in our body cause us to feel certain things. And the teachings are, no, it's your beliefs and your thoughts that, that cause you to feel things. And you can, if they're subconscious, you can raise them up and you can choose again. You can choose the miracle in a miraculous way of perceiving the world. There's an interesting definition that Jesus has for pain. And Jesus says, pain is a wrong perception. So, he's not talking about physical pain because for Jesus, the world isn't really physical. It's a mental world. There's another point where Jesus says, all illness is mental illness. This is why I was talking at the very beginning of this talk and everybody was laughing when I was saying, don't deny the power of thoughts and don't deny the power of the mind and don't just stop with feeling your way back to heaven. You've got to, you've got to look at the whole package. You've got to see what's going on underneath those feelings because those subconscious beliefs and those thoughts that are not in awareness, that are out of awareness, have got to be exposed and released in order to choose consistently to be at peace, to be consistently miracle-minded. So, Jesus says this is a course in mind training and when we have people that come to our centers or wherever we are, visiting people in their houses or on the road doing retreats, phone calls, Skype calls, Zoom calls, Zoom retreats, online retreats, all the ways we do it, we're all focused on this mind training which is raising up this subconscious and making everything in your mind a conscious decision. Because in the end, to accept the atonement or salvation that the Christians call it, you, it has to be a conscious decision. You can't just say the words, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, and bingo! <laughs> You've said the magic words. <laughs> you know, that sometimes Christians believe that all you have to do is say the words. But what about the mind? What about your experiences? Or if you can say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior with all your heart and soul and might, and you can fully grasp that mind that was in Christ Jesus, that that Christ mind, then, then it's real for you. But if you just say the words and you still have these unconscious ego beliefs that are still, you know, wrong-minded decisions, I'll call them, uh, for pain and suffering and so on and so forth, then just to say the words, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, you know, he talked about that. He said, many will come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I know you not. What he was really saying is, 
come to me with a pure heart and I'll say, you made it. <laughs> but don't come to me with this Lord, Lord stuff. <laughs> and as long as you still have these subconscious beliefs that are really devoted to the ego. You know, they're evo devoted to denying God. I think that's that's the spirit of what we really are talking about. When we talk about community, we always talk about purpose, we always talk about the prayers, and we always talk about the mind training. For us, a retreat without mind training, what's the point? For us, a center without mind training, what would be the point? For me, even travel, why would I travel without a purpose? You know, that was one of the early things I had to be taught by Jesus because when he first took me on the road, uh, he said, stay with me, stay with me. I'll tell you where to go and I'll direct everything. I'll take care of you. I'll take everything. I remember the, I talked about the second night out uh, going to this course group. I think the, th the third day of that same trip, I went to, uh, I went from Tulsa, I went over to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And I was hosted by this woman. And she was very happy and very bright. And she said, tonight, David, I'm going to take you to the cowboy Hall of Fame Museum. And I went and I had the best time. And I'm not exactly a tourist or a sightseer, but if Jesus wants to set up a holy encounter at the Oklahoma City Cowboy Hall of Fame Museum, I'm all in. Because I'm not going there to look at ropes or <laughs> or steers or or cowboy pictures. I was there for the encounter with my host who was hosting me at her house, Marcella. And when Marcella invited me to go, I was like, "Yes." And and that's how Jesus works with us. We don't tend to try to push away things and avoid things. It's all doing it with the guidance. You can be happy and bring your light anywhere. You don't have to have special circumstances. You don't always have to live in quiet places or you don't always have to have certain circumstances and situations to shine the light of the world. You can shine it wherever you're instructed to go. So to me, that was still a question of prayer. I could always, I could feel this was a whole thing that was answering my question, how do I get at the subconscious mind? Jesus said, I'll, we'll, we'll watch movies together. I'll point things out to you. We'll listen to music. That will flush stuff up. Uh, relationships. Oh, relationships are so intense of mirrors of the unconscious mind. Relationships actually give us a f do us the favor of getting in touch with our unconscious mind in the most rapid way possible. <laughs> if you really want to get into the subconscious mind, live with people. Just live with people. And if you try to live with a whole group of them, ah, that subconscious mind doesn't have a chance. Absolutely no chance. Even the first four of, with A Course in Miracles can and Helen and Bill and Judy, those four, first four devotees of Jesus that were part of the plan were all given specific roles. Helen was the scribe. That was her main function. Scribe, get, the, get it from the thoughts into the, the words. Bill was the, the gentle, calm comforter. He also typed the words of the Course from the shorthand dictation that Helen received. Ken was the teacher. Ken was the first teacher to be the first teacher of the Course in Miracles. And Judy was the publisher. Judy, Judy was to disseminate it and get it out to the world. 
Now the interesting thing about those four, did they have resistance? You bet. Did they have struggles? Yes. Did they live together? No. Imagine if those four <laughs> had had to live together. Jesus was, no, that's too much. No, no, we're just trying to get it into the realm. <laughs> Helen had enough to deal with with her husband, Louis. <laughs> Bill had enough to deal with with his profession, with his sexuality, with all kinds of things. Ken had plenty to deal with. With Gloria. <laughs> I met Gloria. He had lots of, and Gloria and lots of others. And Judy had, I was having lunch, before I came over here, I was having lunch with Judy. And I was, I was going to show, we were going to show her Francis's movie, Take Me Home. And I said, Judy, you're going to really like this movie because in the movie there's a marriage in the movie. And Judy said, well, I should know I like marriages. Because I said, you like marriages. She said, yeah, I, I should know I've had three of them. <laughs> so just individually, these four <laughs> had a lot to deal with. Now, with our community, we live together. When you live under the same roof and you have that purpose up there, all hell is going to break loose in your subconscious mind. If you have, I always say that it's two fastest way to the gods are silence, stillness and meditation, and relationships, living with other people. That's the fast track. And if you want the fastest track of all, do both. Pray, meditate, have long periods of silence, and have relationships. That's like sending a rotor rooter down there in the subconscious like okay, you know, the light will just be like scrubbing and and shining and cleaning in there. And that the ego, it gets flushed out of its hiding space in a hurry. But we are onto it now. We know the we know what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are, are doing. We know the fast track. And that was part of what we really were talking about. The mind training with <laughs> Francis is like... <laughs> it's not our plan, but... <laughs> That's 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 exactly what what it is. When a group of people are living together, it's it flash up the unconscious. But also that's why some guidelines need to come in, because when a group of people come together, and none of us had any reference point of how to truly live together for the purpose of not making making it in the world. You know, the purpose is so different from our previous lives. We're not in there to form normal friendships. You know, we're not there to try to manage every aspect of our life so we don't have conflicts with, with each other. And we're not really there to have a goal that we are all um, can, can see and tangible and we know exactly how to achieve them, none of it. So we all come together and to say, okay, we, we want to wake up, and we want, we're here to do mind training together. And what happens is projections happen. Projections onto the ones that are close to you happen all the time. So that's why um, some guidelines came in as a way to help, to guide and direct as a reference point of how to do this, to continue with this direction and actually even make this even faster. Because the temptation when we come together was we do not see projections as projections. We see as people are difficult. And living with people are so difficult, and we just want to be left alone. And we do not want to deal with those kind of emotions and the situations. So the temptation is to isolate. The temptation is actually to, to think something went wrong, and the temptation is to hide and to, to repress, repress everything that wants to come up. To please. 
to please each other so we don't trip on each other's toes. So we don't feel like we're, you know, we're disapproved. We're unloved. We're excluded. So all of those emotions just come out of nowhere, and it was so hard to face. So that was the 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 thing. And also, really, nobody had a roadmap of all how to navigate our own emotions. The only roadmaps we had in this life was to stay away from those emotions, stay away from people that、uh, you don't like. You know, if if stay away from jobs that is too difficult, and build be around people that make you feel comfortable, seek approvals, have achievements in the world, so you have a sense of importance and have a sense of worth, and you 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 know you have a sense of confidence. Develop yourself, 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 and f- protect yourself. Protect yourself. So that's that's the roadmap we came up with. You know, we 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 came with. So when we come together, okay, that 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 roadmap wouldn't work anymore. So、and、that's the roadmap to keep the ego. That's the roadmap to keep the ego because that's the roadmap to say. I'm I'm separate. I'm individuals, and those are other individuals that are outside of my mind. I have no control over that realm, and I actually have no control over what's coming inside either. But so let's just manage and manage. But、um, the guide, the guidelines that、um, that David heard for the community at very earlier、um, phases. Were no people pleasing and no private thoughts. So you can imagine already, people are living together, and we're just there to to get in touch with this unconscious mind and unconscious decisions that are running our lives. Anyways, it's not like because it's unseen, it's not really active. Then we come together, and the instructions take the lid off. Don't protect. Don't put a mask on. Be authentic. That's really what, in essence, you know. No private thoughts can sound scary because it, if 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 it is interpreted as at the beginning, you know, I know I had those thoughts. If people know how dark my thinking are, that is that's not to be shared. That's not to be shared because I have judgment about everything, and I am frightened to let people know. And I thought private, no private thought would mean you talk about your judgment about everybody, point your fingers at everybody, and that is not that is not what no private thought means. So no private thought is the assumption, the reverse reversal of the assumption. Okay, you have no private thoughts, and yet that's all you're aware of. That's from the course. So that's all I'm aware of. All I'm aware of is I'm a private mind, having my own private thoughts, and other people are having private thoughts about everything. That's that's the assumption we live by. So really, the 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 attempt to is to go back to the direction that Jesus Jesus want us to have a very practical guideline, so we can go back to this awareness that we're one mind. That's really what is underlying this guideline. So the direction has to be reversed, and the way we're doing it is not to reinforce projections. It's not to say, "Oh, finally, I I can judge freely." No, that's not <laughs> that's not not the purpose. Again, the purpose is to forgive, to forgive. I believe to be my thoughts, to forgive what I believe to be my private thoughts. That's the purpose. So, yeah. So I don't know whether we jump straight into the the practical. Things of how to do it, or you want to even, but feel free to jump in any time. So, because the purpose is not to just judge freely and justify the judgment and anger, 
the purpose is to forgive, but the first step to forgive is you have to know what you're thinking. Like the clip that we showed yesterday, she she was pushed into this situation so much that she could not get away. I mean, there was a moment where she thought, oh, there is a second bathroom here. I have people around me. I'm so grateful. She got in touch with this gratitude and felt uplifted. And yet the anger came back. You know, it's it's not fully forgiven. So it's always going to come back. So she really had to see the effect of her thoughts. She got in so much pain with her own hatred. She saw the thoughts, I want to kill them back. I want to revenge their evil people. And she even so much so, and she got into the thoughts that this particular prayer, forgive your trespasses, I cannot forgive them. So she got really clearly in touch with the things that she was imprisoned by. She saw them. And once you see them, then you can make a decision. I don't want them anymore. Help me take them away. I don't want them anymore. So, so the no private thoughts, when it comes down to how it looks, it really, just as we need guidelines, you know, we, we normally share in the environment with guidelines how to share those so-called or believed private thoughts. They're not real, they're not justified, but we believe so, and we're holding them, and that's affecting our peace. So we, we have guidelines of how to share them. We own the thoughts, and we, we start from how it affected our state of mind. I feel anger now. I feel the emotion of fear. And what is associated with those emotions are I, I think this, I think this, I think this. Those are the thoughts. So it's taking full responsibility, not you did this, you did this. It's, it's none of that. But it's just look very clearly. But I can even tell you, I can take a step further to say if the intention to let them go is not the real intention, then even do the expression session is not going to serve the purpose of free you up. The freedom and the release comes straight away when the desire of letting them go is there. And then the f it seems to take the form of let's Let's actually take the lid off. You can do it with someone you trust so that you don't have to pretend or filter thoughts. You can do it with yourself. In the end, you can just do it in your mind with the Holy Spirit because you're so sa you feel so safe of letting them up. But at the beginning, you know, because it seems to be triggered by, tr by people, you know, we just don't see it's our own thoughts and our, our own judgment it's the people it's the people and we're terrified to share those thoughts so the 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 face in our community um about letting go of those thoughts take the shape of what we call expression sessions or one on one sessions and again and again we stress the purpose when you come to a session really feel that you have enough of this pain and suffering, you're ready to let it go. Then we take it from there. Then we talk about, okay, what are the, rise, the emotions that rises up right now and what are the thoughts underneath it? And normally people feel instantaneous release. Instantaneous. And then that is even just release in the moment, but really... There are bigger um, there are bigger implications of those those sharing private thoughts because ultimately the purpose is to see that those thoughts are not 
not mine. Those thoughts are ego thoughts, and everybody having stories are, are making up stories from the same ego thoughts and believed to be theirs. And I, I'm not. It's not really my thoughts because I was thinking again about the, what I said in the first night. These silent retreats I did um, when I was talking to one on ones with the participants. They all have really solid stories about their uh, issues, which turn out to be the theme of the day from absolutely every single one of them. But they have very very concrete stories of why this is their problem. But it's so interesting because the next day the, the issues are completely opposite and then everybody is having the same issues. But the purpose of sharing those private thoughts eventually is, is pointing at a total release, not temporary release, not release from a situation. It's a total release to the point of leaping point that these are not my thoughts and I am not ego. And I reach the point of the decision that I see I can make a choice to choose to believe these ego thoughts or not completely. And that is the master switch. And that's a total conscious decision. With that conscious decision, there is no, no victimhood in absolutely any situation. No victimhood in pain, in sickness, no victimhood in being born or dying in this world because they all fall into one category. They're all ego thoughts. But that's, the, that's really the point. We are being guided and using our everyday situations and triggers and using all our mighty companions who hold the same purpose to go toward that release point, total release point. So, so that is one guideline, uh, no private thoughts. And the no people pleasing is, is again tied into that because you're going to take total responsibility for your state of mind. You're not acting and behaving for approval of others, for others to give their nod and say, oh, very good, very good, or to say, thank you for doing this and doing that. I like you. I want to have you in my life. We're not, we're not acting just to stay into situations, dream situations. Our goal is to go inward in our mind and release the judgments so that we can experience the happy dream of forgiveness. We're not trying to go in. When we believe in the reality of this world, you also believe that you're a victim. And the workbook lesson from the Course is, I am not the victim of the world I see. So, even if we looked at other philosophies, like there are Eastern philosophies that say that the soul just keeps incarnating and reincarnating and coming into form, into time and space to learn its lessons until it learns its perfect lessons and then it doesn't need to reincarnate anymore. And that's the common system. Well, you really want me to blow your mind? I'll give you s something that's way beyond that. If you think that that sounds plausible and believable, Jesus said, when you came to this world, you brought the world with you. You didn't come to a pre-existing world. It's almost like you, you were flying around, you're like a soul, and you've got a little soul backpack. And what's in the backpack? The whole cosmos is in the backpack. Fly, fly, oh, I'm an independent soul, and I've got a cool backpack because the whole cosmos is in there, and all I have to do is open this one little button Back here, whoo! I throw out the whole cosmos. That's why you pick your parents. That's why you pick your the, the era that you're born in. You don't incarnate into it. You project it out. There's just one mind, and instead of incarnating into a world that was already pre-existing before you got there, 
and then you had to deal with uh, this dysfunctional family. No, guess what? Where the dysfunctional family comes from? It's in your backpack. You threw it out there. If you're believing you're separate, it's not hard to believe you could project a dysfunctional family, right? And maybe even a dysfunctional environment. Maybe even Holocaust. Maybe even concentration camps. What seems to be all kinds of abusive situations. It's all in there. When you came to this world, you brought the world with you, is what Jesus said. Now, that can seem like, that's mind-blowing. Nobody ever taught us that. What, what scripture did you get that from? A Course in Miracles. Like I said, it'll blow your mind. But also what it's saying is this, this completely aligns with the teachings of quantum physics. The teachings of quantum physics, which actually have been around you know, about eight decades now, so it's not like it's a new kid on the block. You know, we've had quantum, quantum physics is teaching that there is no world apart from what you think. There is no world apart from consciousness. You might say all your consciousness, whatever you think, feel, believe, you will witness because you project it. And not only that, A Course in Miracles takes this beautiful quantum physics idea and says there's not even an inner and an outer. That's what the Course workbook will do for you. It will teach you that there is no world apart from what you think. Why do you think Jesus has one of his early lessons? My thoughts are images I have made. He's making the connection between the thoughts and the images. You may think that you're in a, a real barn room with real people, sitting next to real people. But this is a collection of thoughts that has not left the mind of the thinker. You're perceiving this in a quantum way. And, and the only way you can be totally happy is to start to realize that this is all part of the same field. It's all the same. It's all unified. It's all unified awareness. It's all unified energy. It's not really separate people. All these thoughts have been collected together in, in a beautiful state of awareness that has no judgment in it. That's, that's forgiveness. But you see how much you have to let go of in your mind. Private minds, private thoughts, private souls. You know, people tell me, what are we going to do? we got a massive collective issue going on here. And I said, what do you mean? They go, well, we got seven billion souls that, that can't agree with each other. It's a mess. There aren't seven billion separate souls. There's only one. The soul is spirit, and the spirit is one. That's why we don't have actually a collective you know, in the Star Trek, they always would talk, remember the Borg? They're called the collective unconscious. The Borg. They assimilate other races and species into their collective unconscious. Wait a minute. Why, should, why not talk about the collective consciousness of forgiveness? Doesn't that sound more fun? We're all the same one? You see... That's how radical forgiveness is, and that's why these techniques of no private thoughts and no people-pleasing are just practical guidelines to use in daily living. In fact, when I went to China, it was uh, Nashin, uh, the first man that took the, the Course in Miracles to China. I got to meet him. His name was Nashin. And he toured around with us to Shanghai and, and Beijing and Hainan. And we were in the van with him and we were going around. He's very happy. And finally, one day he wrote to me and he said, Ah, David, I see now that your two guidelines, uh, no private thoughts, no people pleasing, relate to the introduction of A Course in Miracles. And I said, What do you mean? He said, no private thoughts, no people pleasing is practical application of nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. 
But they were given guidelines so that we could come back into our mind without blaming, without projecting, without getting all wrapped up in the emotions and who did what to us, as if the world was happening to us apart from our choice and apart from our will, when actually everything that we experience is exactly what we ask for. These are the teachings of A Course in Miracles. If every time you are tempted to blame somebody or to point the finger at somebody, you simply remember these words, it will snap you out of it instantly. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings that I experience and I decide the goal that I would achieve. And everything that happens to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Wow! If you jump into those words and as a living experience, you are guaranteed peace of mind because you're not going to be throwing out this world as if it's external to your mind and blaming, blaming your parents, blaming your siblings, blaming your teachers, blaming your partners, blaming your extended family members, blaming your society, blaming your government, blaming your president, on and on and on. The blame game is how you stay asleep. And the forgiveness game is how you wake up. And that's why we're here. We're here to, to enjoy the forgiveness game for a while. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, everything feels radical in the ego's judgments. You know, living together and being non-productive together in the world, n not trying to earn a living, not having insurance, not having a security plan for the future, not... Um, yeah, not putting a mask on, not being careful to protect your emotions, saying, being truthful to yourself, to your feelings all the time. It sounds all very radical, but ultimately, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Nothing real can be threatened. So all of the thing, ego would say that this is chaos. This is chaos. If this is how, that's how my mom thought it's going to be for my life when I first stepped out of a very secure life of marriage, properties, and um, a business. She just thought, it's, who is going to look after if you get sick? I don't know. I will find out. How, who is going to, you think you're just going to live like that? I need to find out. I mean, you're wrong. Okay, then let me find out for myself. I need to know. That's, in the end, she and I have to reach the point because I cannot convince, neither of us can convince each other. In the end, I had to say, you might be right, but this is what the Course says, and I have to find out. And let me use my life to find out. And then if, if, if it is wrong, I find out too, you know, ultimately, if it is all wrong, then let me find out. So, how are you going to, what are you going to do if you get sick? Let me find out. Who is going to look after you? Let me find out. You're not going to be able to live like this. Let me find out. So, that's, that becomes the answer, you know, I have, I had no idea. I'm just going one step at a time according to the plan, and then finding out as I go, actually. And it's, it's absolutely amazing because, because no people pleasing, indi basically saying just be truthful, like whatever um, John said to Jack in the movie last night, it all comes down to just tell the one you love, you love them, and be truthful whenever you can. And we can all relate. That feels right to be true to yourself. 
It feels right. It, it doesn't even matter whether it's leading to the ultimate spiritual awakening or not. It just some, somehow feels right. And Jesus ta talks about 10 characteristics of teacher for God. Number one, we all know trust. Trust is the most important thing, and all other characteristics are based on trust. And after trust, the second one is honesty. And he says honesty is consistency. Consistency of what I think and what I say and what I do. So nothing I say is in contradiction to what I think. That is also no private thoughts. If I hold private thoughts, what is private thoughts except the need to hide and protect because they're private? Why are they private? Because I, I make them private. There is some kind of need to protect. Otherwise, they're just whatever. They're common thoughts. The sky is blue. So basically, he is saying whatever you say and do and think are in total alignment and not in contradiction with each other. And that is the second characteristics of teacher for God. And that is what honesty is. And that is what no people pleasing is. Because people pleasing indicates that you're doing something in seeking for an external goal, for an approval. That's against, you know, people pleasing is not a form. Um, a definition of the form is not saying that if you're being loving, you're being people-pleasing. No, it's, it's more than an attitude. It's more like where you're coming from. Is, it's not really w how you feel. You feel you have to act a certain way to fit in, uh, to be res a responsible person or be some kind of a person that you will you'll be approved of by others and by the society. That's, and, and that is against how you feel. That is the, the guidelines about you don't need to do that. You know, just, just, just get in touch with how you feel and find a way to express how you truly feel. Nothing real can be threatened. And that is what no people pleasing is. So, so really, it, it goes hand in hand with no private thoughts. If you feel in conflict within yourself, then share, share that. I'm in conflict with myself because this, these are my thoughts and this is what I feel I have to do. So those are how we use um, the guidelines because then every day, you know, there's seemingly a lot of tasks. You know, you can see the tag team, they're constantly being focused on, on the functions are given, but they're all backdrops. In the end, a lot of the, the, the time and the mind are spent on, let's get in touch with how we feel. Let's get in touch with what are our true feeling and thoughts, and are we in alignment? Can we find a way to communicate and not to hide and protect it? So, yeah. Yeah, I think it really starts to clear up this thing about no people pleasing is, is it runs so deep, but really it's about getting in touch with that motivation for love in, inside you. That you can actually live your life totally inspired by joy, totally inspired by love, totally inspired by happiness without having to react and respond to the world. That you have it all inside of you. Remember how I said last night, in you is everything that is perfect, ready to radiate through you and out into the world. So, for example, when people don't understand people-pleasing, they, they think it's like that, um, well, that means you should just do what you want to do and, and pay no attention to what anybody thinks or does or whatever, but, but it's still missing the mark because we're here to be inspired by prayer, guided by instruction, living an intuitive life, connected to our source, and living from a place of love. 
recently and quite often people will say, well, how does this thing of no people pleasing fit with that part in the text where Jesus says, if somebody asks you to do something outrageous, do it. And then, a hundred pages later, in, in the early editions, now there's so many editions I can't even say that. It's like it's just gotten to be a mess. But in the earlier editions, a hundred pages later, Jesus said, I to once told you, if somebody asks you to do something outrageous, do it. And he says, as, he qualifies it, he says, as long as it doesn't bring harm to you or to anyone else. And that's very helpful uh, to add that last part on there. And also, but how does that fit with people pleasing? If I'm supposed to do something that is outrageous and I'm supposed to do it anyway, that seems like uh, pleasing this outrageous person, an outrageous request out there. That seems like people pleasing. And I go back to that example when I was asked to speak at that conference out there in the Bay Area of California. And they said, we're going to do this thing. We're two ministers out there and we're going to time your responses. We're just going to make a request to have a stopwatch on you so you can speak for a minute or two. That might qualify as an outrageous request. Not that it necessarily would bring harm to anybody else, but that's one. That's a good example. And, and in a loving way, I went in and tuned in with Jesus and, and went along with the outrageous request, which eventually turned into a lot of laughter, all of us laughing together at time. And that was the miracle. So what we're talking about is if you have all of these acting for approval. We'll say if you have projected a world of specialness and now you're going to please mom, please dad, please your siblings, please your teachers, please your Course in Miracles teachers. I mean, please, 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 please all over the place. Why aren't you connecting with the Holy Spirit and coming from a place of love and letting that be your motivations thinking miraculous thoughts because Jesus tells us what you do comes from what you think. So you want to be having miraculous thoughts because they're going to inspire your actions. Your, your behaviors are going to flow from those thoughts. It's not the other way around. You know, your behaviors don't change your mind. You change your mind and then your behaviors can seem to shift and change when you've made that attitude adjustment in your mind. Because the mind is causative. You have to re always remember it. Behaviors are not causative. They're effects. Mind and, and thoughts are causative. That's so important. To This is like giving a full context for what the true meaning of this people-pleasing is because as long as you try to understand it from a superficial level, at just the level of persons and behaviors, then it's not understandable. But once you get into Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Have integrity. How can you have integrity if you don't have an integrated mind? If everything is occurring in your mind and all of the levels of your mind aren't integrated into a miracle, into a divine flow, then you have no chance of being in, having integrity because your actions will sometimes seem to be different from what you're thinking or feeling. Remember some of the songs we grew up with? Smile though your heart is breaking. Smile even though you're aching. Oh, come on. Now that is people-pleasing. <laughs> that song is, is draped with people-pleasing, you know. Just put on a happy face. Even though your subconscious feels dark and grim, just put on a happy face. When you're feeling dark and you're feeling suicidal, mm, just be nice. Just be nice. Wait a minute. I'm feeling suicidal. How do I act nice when I'm feeling suicidal? Smile. Though your heart is breaking. You know, it's... The contradictions go on and on in this world where we've been so taught that we have to wear a mask. Otherwise, we're going to be rejected. Otherwise, we're going to be abandoned. 
if we don't keep that happy mask and that peaceful mask on, then people will leave. You know, we're sure, pretty sure people will leave our life. We're going to be lonely. We're going to be all alone if, if we start letting up the unconscious. And Jesus is saying, no, it's safe. I'm with you. You have to give yourself permission to get in touch with this unconscious. You're, you're actually going to have to allow some of those uncomfortable feelings to come up into awareness. And Jesus even addresses that. He says that in the early stages of your mind training, the Holy Spirit must use contrast and, and at times must allow a certain level of discomfort to come into the mind. Why would the Holy Spirit want subconscious uncomfort coming into the mind? So that you have an impetus and you, have, you see a need for change of your mind. So you can say, I do not like how I feel. This sounds like rules for decision. I do not like how I feel. I must have decided wrongly. You see? This is how the Holy Spirit works. Bring it up. Let it move up, but don't stay there. Don't linger with the suffering. Don't linger with the discomfort. Change your mind. Come back to your purpose. Come back to your reason, setting the goal. Come back to your original decision from rules for decision. You know, decide the kind of day that you want. And say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given to me. Those are the first two rules for decision that Jesus is giving us. And he's giving us the most practical way. Don't censor those feelings, but also when they come into awareness, use it as, as a need to call on the miracle and choose again. It's good stuff. Wow. Our hours are flying by here. <laughs> we are flying by. Well, we just want to thank you. Uh, we will have another amazing movie tonight. We will go on another movie adventure. It's like we go hiking, hiking along during the, on the green mountains during the day. We go scuba diving at night into our unconscious, uh, letting the movies bring up <laughs> all of our emotions. And then we can rest and have sweet dreams and come fresh another day for some more dismantling and more undoing. But it can be pleasant. What I'm saying is, don't think that dismantling and, and undoing is necessarily upsetting. I mean, it, at times it can seem that way, but the more you do this, the more you can actually have fun with your spiritual awakening. I'm into the fun. I, that's why I like to use, show these movies and we, I like to do things the way we're talking about because if you can't have some fun in life, then what's the point? You know, there has to be some fun in awakening. And I was very determined to find it. And now that I did find it, I'm, I'm very happy to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, keep an eye on the screen for this afternoon. I know some of you actually missed the session yesterday because uh, it wasn't mentioned, but uh, we, we normally have a session in the afternoon, so just keep an eye. If it is free, we will announce it on the screen as well, so just keep an eye at lunchtime. So, yeah. Thank you. Happy lunch. Have a great lunch. <laughs> <laughs>